I'd say around about 2015 and a vast sway of society was getting bored with the official narrative such as the what the BBC put out, uh, Facebook, Twitter, a lot of these sort of sites and they were sort of searching for alternative sites and what I believe came from the cabinet office and maybe the Mindscape program was they wanted to get everyone centred into one specific area and I believe that area online was the speaker's corner down uh, by Hyde Park a lot of daily dramas it's just constant um, you have certain characters the people in this video I'm not insinuating that they uh, work for the government or that they're some form of characters I'm just showing you the daily dramas which have been happening quite a lot here for quite a few years and it seemed to get everyone who wanted to sort of do something locally driven into the central point of division and dramas and daily beefs and the, there isn't really much um, remedies and uh, ways of looking forward as communities it seems to be a massive honey pot uh, a melting pot for all the religions all the races all the ideas all the political movements and that in a way is good but at the same time it becomes violent and issues are never really solved and you could watch a video three years ago and nothing's changed um, I'm thinking it's a place where they analyze uh, they get everyone's data same on YouTube they, all these videos that people put out of speakers corner and the certain characters and then the uh, reactions to all these characters around this is all just data mining um, and trying to pigeonhole everyone into certain sections so that they control the narrative that way because people they don't want people searching for alternative ideas and then building on these ideas by the 1600s the greatly overpopulated tiny and ancient city had become far too crowded many iron mills 80,000 people burning coal to warm their wooden houses many wharfs and boat houses textile factories and the streets were made of mud between 1603 to 1646 over 100,000 people died of the Yashinia pestis bacterium which persisted to remain in the city for over 100 years known as the bubonic plague Coincidentally and conveniently, between 1665 and 1666, over 100,000 people died again of bacterium within a year, known as the Great Plague, where a third of the city's people died, and almost the entire city was ravaged in a week-long fire, started by an agent of Rome, Robert Hubert, who was later convicted and hanged of the crime for starting the fire, which was called the Great Fire of London and destroyed 80% of the original city. During the week of the fire, Parliament made the Sescu QV Act of 1666 law, which presumed everyone in the country was dead, and from then on, they presume everyone is dead, incompetent, and lost at sea. Basically, we are corporate slaves controlled by the Crown and have no rights. Following the devastation, Christopher Wren designed the lavish streets for the very high quality buildings, 50 churches, banks, grand palaces and many important buildings that we still see today. Notice earlier how I said coincidentally and conveniently because it took London from an overpopulated slum uh, built on wharfs and boathouses and trade and commerce to the most powerful square on the planet still today which controls commerce, trade and the world's money supply. 50% of the entire world's money runs through the city of London in means of derivatives which is spread out between the tax havens. The decisions taken here behind closed doors affect all of our lives daily as they control the doctrine of the cabinet office and the government's policies taken. It houses the cabinet office, the treasury, 
war rooms, Cobra Anti-Terror Group and many other important subcommittees, places of power and institutions who work for the government. Its key task is to make sure government business works properly and all departments within government talk to each other properly. They are also the keeper and allowed to hold all information of all the past and present government's secrets and information, unlike the current government and Prime Minister who can only look into current business. It's the hidden seat of power and where real political change is orchestrated without the average person knowing anything. Whitehall and the Cabinet Office have been rebuilt many times but has been around since at least the 1500s since uh, King Henry VIII um, used these buildings and then later was turned into the Cabinet Office after World War I was declared as England needed a committee purely on uh, protecting the United Kingdom from war. So Whitehall and the Cabinet Office is the major seat of power within the UK. The Tavistock Institute was financed by the Rockefeller Foundation and is a research program involved in human behaviour, social sciences and psychology. What it really does is implement psychological torment on those who expose corruption in society. Today the Tavistock Institute is covertly involved with social networking sites, alternative media, conspiracy forums, they um, set up honey pots and divide and conquer organic communities like I've mentioned in videos before. The USAF and DARPA run covert programs on the internet using research developed from the Tavistock Institute. Their goal is mass manipulation of society through social networking and psychological torture on those researching conspiracy or on those exposing the criminals run in society. The word conspiracy theorist is a term these criminals created as a form of neuro-linguistic programming to automatically discredit those that research or investigate criminality. The Tavistock Clinic is stationed in London and is directly involved with the British government and the House of Windsor. The United States Department of Defence and intelligence agencies are infiltrated by the British Crown and and basically was set up by the Tavistock Institute, a lot of these sort of um, places and companies and big world governing programs. The BNP, British National Party, was set up in 1982 by John Tyndall, currently is run by Nick Griffin, whose father, grandfather and brothers all have been proven to be Freemasons. They are the right wing of the political scale and they always seem to come and get involved during mass debates and there seems to be problems within the ranks of the BNP, such as Nazi members named Mark Collette, who was the head of the young BNP, was kicked out and then became head of public relations later on. As for Nick Griffin, his presence in the party is said to be like a Trojan computer virus that's designed to destabilise and restrict the effectiveness of the BNP. And then you have people like Tommy Robinson, and Mark Collette who are dividing communities of the right wing and causing trouble in certain places. MI5 and MI6 are both intelligence agencies but do different things. The MI5 is responsible for protecting the UK its citizens and interests at home and overseas against the threats to national security. MI6 is responsible for gathering intelligence outside the UK in support of the government's security, defence, foreign and economy policies. MI5 is headed by Ken McCallan. MI6 is headed by Alex Younger. MI5 is answerable to the Home Secretary. MI6 is answerable to the Foreign Secretary. MI5's headquarters are Thames, London. MI6 is Vauxhall Cross. The UK's Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre, JTAC, analyses intelligence relating to international terrorism and produces classified 
assessments of threats to the UK government, department and agencies. The House of Lords is the upper house of the Parliament of the United Kingdom. Membership is granted by appointment or by hereditary or official function. Like the House of Commons, it meets in the Palace of Westminster. Unlike the elected House of Commons, members of the House of Lords, excluding 90 hereditary peers elected among themselves and two peers who are ex officio members, are appointed. The membership of the House of Lords is drawn from the peerage and is made up of the Lords Spiritual and the Lords Temporal. The Lords Spiritual are 26 archbishops, established the Church of England of the Lords Temporal. The majority are life peers who are appointed by the monarch on the advice of the Prime Minister or on the advice of the House of Lords Appointment Commission. This is where usually the final say in most of the laws are made. It goes from the House of Commons to the House of Lords and if it starts in the House of Lords it will go to the Commons and then back to the House of Lords. The Lords scrutinises bills as well and then goes back to the Commons. The Queen's speech is delivered in the House of Lords during the state opening of Parliament in addition to the role as the upper house until the establishment of the Supreme Court in 2009, the House of Lords, through the Law Lords, acted as the final court of appeal in the United Kingdom. The Heptarchy is the name applied to the seven kingdoms of the Anglo-Saxon England. Settlements in Britain from the 5th century until the consolidation into the four kingdoms of Murphia, Northumbria, Wessex and East Anglia in the 8th century. The term heptarchy, arch, reign, rule and the suffix ia, ia alludes to the tradition that there were seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms usually enumerated as East Anglia, Essex, Kent, Mercia, Northumbria, Sussex and Wessex. By convention, the Heptarchy period lasted from the end of the Roman rule in the 5th century until most of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms came under the ownership of Agbert of Wessex in 829. This approximately 400 year period of European history is often referred to as the early Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. The Seven Kingdoms and sub-kingdoms fluctuated rapidly as kings contended for supremacy after the fall of the Roman Empire. In 2010, it was disclosed in UK media that a number of undercover police officers had, as part of their false persona, entered into intimate relationships with members of targeted groups and in some cases proposed marriage or even father children with protesters who were unaware their partner was a police officer in a role as part of their official duties. Various legal actions followed, including eight women who took action against the Metropolitan Police, stating they were deceived into long-term intimate relationships by five officers. Although the units had been previously disbanded, other cases continued to emerge. In 2015, the public undercover policing inquiry under a senior judge was announced. The Metropolitan Police published an unreserved apology in which it exonerated and apologised to the women it had deceived and stated the methodology had constituted abuse and gross violation with severity. In 2016, new cases continued to come to light and it wasn't until around about 2018-19 when various members of Parliament and the social media were starting to expose the spy cops. In politics, lobbying, persuasion or interest representation is the act of lawfully attempting to influence the actions, policies or decisions of government officials, most often legislators or members of regulatory agencies. Lobbying, which usually involves direct face-to-face -face contact, is done by many types of people 
associations, organisations, corporations, groups, including the private sector, corporations, fellow legislators or government officials or advocacy groups or interest groups. Lobbyists may be among a legislator's constituency, meaning a voter or a block of voters within their electoral, electoral district. They may engage in lobbying as a business. Professional lobbyists are people whose business is trying to influence legislation, regulation or other government decisions, laws, actions, policies on behalf of a group or individual who hires them. Individuals and non-profit organisations can also lobby as an act of volunteering or as a small part of their go government job. The EU has over 25,000 official and 25,000 unofficial lobbyists circling its political sphere. In the UK it's around about 15 to 20,000 lobbyists are working. The Green New Deal is a proposed package of the United States legislation that aims to address climate change and economic inequality. The name refers back to the New Deal, a set of social and economic reforms and public works projects undertaken by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in response to the Great Depression. The Green New Deal combines Roosevelt's economic approach with modern ideas such as renewable energy and resource efficiency. In the UK, the Green New Deal Group and the New Economic Foundation produced a Green New Deal report asking for a Green New Deal as a way out of global financial crisis back in 2008, demanding a reform of the financial and tax sectors and a revolutionary of the energy sector in the country. Also, Green MP for Brighton, Carolyn Lucas, raised the idea during an economic debate in 2008 and it has been part of the Green Party's policy for a number of years. It's, I believe, is a way of helping the big green corporate companies to leverage a little bit more power over the old small businesses who are producing more carbon and it will be harder for them to get to a zero point carbon energy unlike the big corporations who will find it a lot easier to get there as they can afford it. The British Bulldog is celebrated as a defeater of the Nazis and champion of democracy but he also hated Indian people, loved eugenics and advocated for poison gas. As far as wrongfully revered 20th century politicians go, Churchill is up there at the very top. By the time he croaked in his London home at the age of 90, Churchill had become many things. The British Bulldog, the Prime Minister who launched the lifeboats to save Europe from Hitler and the unwavering wartime leader who helped to beat the Nazis and secure the fate of the liberal democracy for the West that the West enjoys today. He was also the man who described Indians as beastly people with a beastly religion, raged against Palestinians as barbaric hordes who eat little but camel dung and once mused of his beloved country keep England white is a good slogan. He made over a hundred million in book deals, speeches and memoirs after he left politics and was making over 10,000 per year from politics which is over one million to the day's currency value. So he will help to set up Israel, made it possible for Israel to be set up as well as kept the war programs going throughout Europe and the UK. The Magna Carta is a royal charter of rights agreed to by King John of England at Runnymede near Windsor on the 15th of June 1215, first drafted by Archbishop of Canterbury Stephen Langton to make peace between the unpopular king and a group of rebel barons. It promised the protection of the church rights, protection of the barons from illegal imprisonment, access to swift justice and limitations on feudal payments to the crown to be implemented through a council of 25 barons. Neither side stood behind their commitments and the charter was annulled by Pope Innocent III leading to the First Barons' War. After John's death, the Regency government of his young son Henry III 
reissued the document in 1216, stripped of some of its more radical content in an unsuccessful bid to build political support for their cause. At the end of the war in 1217, it formed part of the peace treaty agreed at Lambeth, where the document acquired the name Magna Carta to distinguish it from the smaller Charter of the Forest, which was issued at the same time. Short of funds, Henry issued the charter again in 1225 in an exchange for a grant of new taxes. His son Edward I repeated the exercise in 1297, this time confirming it as part of England's statute law. The charter became part of the English political life and it was typically renewed by each monarch in turn, although as time went by and the fledgling Parliament of England passed new laws, it lost some of its practical significance. Today only three parts exist under law, the freedom and rights of the Church of England, the ancient liberties and privileges of the City of London, and the rights as a free man to legal process. As for the rest of us, it has no bearing or helps us in any way to protect us. Black Wednesday occurred on the 16th of September 1992 when the British government was forced to withdraw the pound sterling from the European exchange rate, the ERM. After a failed attempt to keep the pound above the lower currency exchange limit mandated by the ERM at the time, the United Kingdom held the presidency of the European communities. In 1997, the UK Treasury estimated the cost of Black Wednesday at 13.4 billion, which was revised to 3.3 billion in 2005, following documents released under the Freedom of Information Act. Treasury papers suggested that if the government had maintained 24 billion foreign currency reserves and the pound had fallen by the same amount, the UK could have made 2.4 billion profit on the pound sterling devaluation. The crisis damaged the credibility of the second major ministry in handling of economic matters. The ruling Conservative Party suffered a landslide defeat five years later at the 1997 general election and did not return to power until 2010. The rebounding of British economy in the years after Black Wednesday led to a reassessment of the legacy of the crisis as the major government's adoption of inflation targeting policy as an alternative to the ERM set the foundations for a prospering economy in the years prior to the financial crisis of 2007-2008 and the British public increasingly turned Eurosceptic after this point. You have people like George Soros who made £2 billion on that day which was a lot of money back in 1992 and has never been held to account for this. The Green Party is formally organised political party based on principles of green politics such as social justice, environmentalism and non-violence. Greens believe that these issues are inherently related to one another as a foundation for world peace. Green party platforms typically embrace social democratic economic policies and forming coalitions with other left-wing parties such as Labour. Green parties exist in nearly 90 countries around the world. Many are members of the Global Greens. They advocate for the Green New Deal, the UN's Woodlands and Wildlands Project and the UN's Migration Pact which will move great numbers of people into the big IoT controlled smart cities from the self-sustaining lands from which they came from. Since 2010 in the UK and most countries the Green changed their policies and actions from local grassroots protesting and activist models to a more politically motivated and engaging model which left a vacuum of protest groups, activism and fighting corporations to the false corporate funded protests and lobbyist groups such as Extinction Rebellion who only seek to further the endeavours of the big zero carbon Green New Deal corporations, 5G network and the electric-driven fourth industrial revolution which is destroying small local business for a more central corporate-driven economy and is not looking to the future towards the amount of materials that they're going to have to mine and take from other places to fulfil the uh, fourth industrial revolution.
The UK went from a colonial superpower in the 1700s to a global financial power in the 1900s. The City of London Corporation and its banks have done tremendous damage to the world's economy since the 1950s and that up to half of all offshore wealth globally is hidden in one of the many British offshore jurisdictions such as Gibraltar, Jersey or Bermuda, accounting for 1.4 quadrillion. With contributions from leading experts, academics, former insiders, lords, ladies, barons, campaigners for social justice and many others, the City of London Corporation and its library companies have been around since the Romans abandoned the UK in 40 AD, leaving the city to the corporation who expanded and fortified the city further and over many centuries to what it is today, the financial capital of the world in so many sectors and ways the price of gold is set twice daily the derivatives market is mainly focused here the world's foreign exchange market financial services private and public bank world headquarters are situated here russian and chinese companies and wealthy people place their foreign assets here away from the dollar it's where most of the world's arms deals are made huge real estate insurance banking and it's a fintech powerhouse it still has an archaic top-down rotten borough system used in electing members of the city council where all of the other boroughs in the country have eventually been abolished a long time ago Direct action is political pressure that by passes the normal means such as parties, elections, petitions, peaceful demonstrations and marches or interest groups lobbying. Political action is designed to attain a purpose by the use of political power or by an activity in political channels usually funding by means of donations as well as the public funded scheme to provide political parties with funding for political campaigns and or elections. Political parties mainly focus on social media nowadays and target the younger and more elderly voters who are either usually not interested, can't make their mind up, inexperienced in politics or just looking to follow the herd. How political action is controlled is by the way the campaign funding system is set up. The way the controlling party in government and the opposing party, which is usually Labour and the Conservatives in the UK, Dems and the Republicans in the US. Then the final legal decisions are usually made within the House of Lords or Senate after going through the House of Commons or the House of Representatives who are usually appointed members, lords of the realm or peers and not elected by members of the public. The Commonwealth of Nations, generally known as the Commonwealth, is a political association of 54 member states, nearly of all which used to be territories of the British Empire. The chief institutions of the organisation are the Commonwealth Secretariat, which focuses on the intergovernmental aspects of the Commonwealth Foundation and non-governmental relations between member states. The Commonwealth date backs to the first half of the 20th century with the decolonisation of the British Empire through increased self-governance of its territories. It was originally created as the British Commonwealth of Nations through the Balfour Declaration at the 1926 Imperial Conference and formalised by the United Kingdom through the Statue of Westminster in 1931. Current Commonwealth of Nations was formally constituted by the London Declaration in 1949, which modernised the community, established the member states as free and equal. The head of the Commonwealth is the Queen. The Queen is the head of state of 16 member states known as the Commonwealth realms, while 33 other members are republics and five have other different monarchs. But with many of the countries gaining to seek independence from not only the British Empire but also the Commonwealth, do you believe that the Commonwealth will survive in the 21st century and also with a monarch change just about to come up with either Prince Charles or his son William taking charge of not only the monarch but the commonwealth political scandals in the united kingdom are commonly referred to by the press as sleaze 
A number of political scandals in the 1980s, 90s, 2000s created the impression of what was described by the British press as sleaze, a perception that then Conservative government was associated with political corruption and hypocrisy, which continues in every single government since. This was revived in the late 90s due to accounts of so-called sleaze by the Labour government, budget leaks, resignations, conflicts of interest, prostitution allegations, affairs within governments, paedophilia, dodgy donations, thefts, covering up for banks and corporations, defying the whip in controversial votes, the royal affairs, corruption charges, tax evasion, misuse of permitted allowances of expenses claimed by members of parliament and a big list of many other things have surfaced over the years, exposed by newspapers or journalists and then managed by the government who usually spin the information for their agenda at the time and to avoid a public outrage. Nowadays the government have not only created society management and are now funding scientific mind analysis programs such as the Mindspace program set up by the Cabinet Office to nudge society into what they say is for the greater good and better for all. Statistics is the discipline that concerns the collection, organisation, analysis, interpretation and presentation of data. In applying statistics to a scientific, industrial or social problem, it is conventional to begin with a statistical population or statistical model to be studied. Populations can be diverse groups of people or objects such as all people living in a country or every atom composing a crystal. Statistics deals with every aspect of data including the planning of data collection in terms of design of surveys and experiments. When census data cannot be collected Statisticians collect data by developing specific experiment designs and survey samples. For instance, they will ask a hundred or a thousand people a question and then base their results as if the entire country has voted on this. In election polls, um, this is when they usually use this to predict the outcome of the final result. Representatives sampling assures that inferences and conclusions can reasonably extend from the sample to the population as a whole. Statistics and results don't lie, but it's how they are interpreted by those giving out the information and results and usually people will sway them towards their own beliefs and how they would like to portray the information. The NHS has been privatised in a number of ways, a process that started at least as long ago as the 1970s but has been accelerating since the Health and Social Care Act of 2012. This introduced a network of clinical commissioning groups, quangos, compartmentalisation, GP consortia and it required them to put health services out to competitive tender. This has allowed the NHS to become more and more open to the involvement of, pri of private sector providers under ratchet mechanisms. Companies such as EY, KPMG, Delaware, PwC and many more are slowly turning in the NHS into an insurance-based institution attached to people's earnings and all this was done under New Labour's poor vision of quashing the quangos which they never did and then later on by David Cameron and Nick Clegg's joint government by giving them contracts to companies such as G4S, Serco and this took up the last remaining NHS contracts. Both sides of the Brexit campaign had some great promises before Brexit. Leave.eu, with the slogan Take Back Control, spent over 18 million on spreading information such as the Red Bus with the words We send the EU £350 million a week down the side. We will easily be able to strike deals and trade. We will gain our sovereignty back. Turkey are coming. We can control our borders and we can't stop an EU army from forming. Some of these statements were true, some were false, and some were well over exaggerated, which caused a lot of problems between a lot of the groups. The Remain side of the argument made many claims such as voting leave will cause a recession, house prices will fall, each household will be £4,300 worse off, we won't be able to buy products from anywhere in the EU, we won't be able to trade with any country in the world and most people would be worse off. 
Again, some of these statements were true, some were false, and some were well over-exaggerated. But in all fairness, both sides of the argument were wrong and over-exaggerated uh, their information to represent their side of the vote. Because when you see what has happened five, nearly six years later, nothing's really happened with Brexit. The term UK PLC, United Kingdom Limited, UK Corporation, .org or many of the other freedom of information requests that have been put in Facebook memes and information floating around is simply a generic shorthand reference to the UK's collective business or many of the other sectors. There has been in the past but now is no company registered at Companies House under any of those names and no such company listed with Dun and Bradstreet. But even if there was a company registered as a corporation which I'm quite sure there will be like the police the law courts and many other administrative powers in the UK and whether or not it has been changed name or hands after the war in 2011 2016 or when we left the European Union and annexing the corporate body or title as well as the physical island of Great Britain it's just a title registered in a corporate world like every other thing that is registered in into a corporate body. Many parts of the UK, but mainly England, have two tiers of local government, county councils and then district, borough or city councils. In some part of the country there is just one unitary tier of local government providing all the local services. The three main types are unitary authorities in shire areas, London boroughs and metropolitan boroughs. County councils, they are responsible for services across the whole of a county like education, transport, planning, social care, libraries, waste management, trading and standards and fire. District, borough or city councils these cover us smaller areas than the county councils such as rubbish collection, recycling, council tax, housing and planning applications. Unitary authorities in London and metropolitan boroughs in some parts of the country, they have one tier of local government which provides all the services above. In London and metropolitan areas, some services like fire, police and public transport are provided through joint authorities. Privatisation of the British Railways was a process by which ownership and operation of the railways of Great Britain was passed from the government control into private hands, which began in 1994 and was completed by around about 1998. The deregulation of the industry was initiated by the EU Directive 91 slash 440 1991 which aimed to create a more efficient rail network by creating greater competition. British Railways has been in state ownership since 1948 under the control of the British Railway Board. Under the Conservative government of Margaret Thatcher elected in 1979 various state owned businesses were sold off including various functions related to the railways, sea link ferries, British transport hotels, travellers fair, uh, British Railways Engineering Limited and many other companies. It was under Thatcher's successor John Major that the railways themselves were privatised using the Railway Act 1993. The operations of the BRB were broken up and sold off and various regulatory functions transferred to the newly created Office of the Rail Regulator. Ownership of the infrastructure including the larger stations are passed to rail track while track maintenance and renewal assets are sold off to 13 companies across the network. Ownership of the passenger trains is split up into rolling stock companies all across the country and there's too many to mention. Originally it was intended that there'd be six but there's I think there's over about 50.